Hello and welcome to our 5G panel session. My name is David McElroy and I work as part of Analysis Mason's online events team. You may have watched some other sessions leading up to this one. However, I just wanted to remind you of a few points that will help you to get the most out of this and all other summit sessions. Firstly, please remember that all sessions are available on demand, meaning that you can access them in an order and at a time and date that is convenient for you. As well as this panel session, we have a selection of keynote and breakout sessions from you to choose from, and you can access all of them via the event homepage. Once you have entered your chosen session, you have the ability to connect with and contact the presenters. You'll be able to access some useful resources and submit questions. Please use the console widgets that are available to you uh, to do all the things I've just mentioned. Now, as these are on-demand sessions, our presenters will pick up your questions and respond to you directly in the coming days via email. Now, once the session has sended, uh, ended, you can click the event homepage and return and select another session. Now, I'll hand over to Chief Analyst Larry Goldman, who will introduce the panelists and kick off the session. So over to you when you're ready, Larry. Thank you, David. Uh, so welcome, everybody. This is our 11th annual summit, but I think it is our first uh, research director panel session. Uh, so uh, welcome to this. And unlike our other sessions where we have uh, presentation slides, this is simply going to be uh, a discussion uh, among the four of us. And we're going to talk about how 5G is developing, what we see happening now, and what we expect uh, for the future. And with me are uh, Stephen Sale, the head of C consumer research, and Tom Rebick, the head of enterprise research, and Caroline Gabriel, uh, head of networks research, in particular, focused on 5G networks. So first of all, we're going to have each of our panelists will give their views on where we are with 5G uh, in each of these areas. And, and I'll start with Stephen about the consumer area. Well, thanks, Larry. Uh, so uh, worldwide, uh, 5G is, is well underway, has been for a couple of years now. Uh, we're looking at something like 160 mobile launches in over 70 countries. Uh, in terms of penetration, how many end users there are, uh, we're looking at a sort of high level of about 25% in South Korea, like a pioneer market here, but more typical is uh, something like 5%, 10% tops. Um, so, so far, it's targeted at early adopters. Um, the, the handset prices have been falling quite, quite quickly over, over the, the past couple of years, so it's becoming more and more affordable, uh, potentially you know, uh, a kind of a, a mass market proposition, $250 for, for a device. Uh, the go-to-market has generally been around big data packages, hundreds of gigabytes are, are, are fairly common now. Uh, it's also supported a bit of a move towards unlimited data packages, sometimes with speed tiering, uh, we've seen a, a fair bit of that in the Nordics. Vodafone has pioneered it, pioneered it in, in many of its markets. And there are some movements in that direction in, in Asia too. Uh, lots of the services have come to market with a, a strong content mix. So AR and VR services are you know, often associated with 5G. We've seen quite a lot of that, particularly in Asia. Uh, probably a more common denominator actually is gaming. Uh, sort of game streaming or cloud gaming services is, is often associated. If we think about what kind of effect this has had, uh, still fairly early days in terms of su subscriber take-up, as I mentioned, uh, there are signs of ARPU uplift amongst the, the, the customers uh, moving from 4G to 5G. So you know, we are typically seeing something like 10% or 20% increase in spend. If you're trying to look at overall mobile ARPU, however, that's harder to, to see in terms of an impact because we're talking small numbers at the moment. And of course, over the past year and a half, we've had COVID uh, acting as a, as, a, as a drag there. Um, I've mentioned mobile. Of course, there's fixed wireless, which is um, probably proceeding with less of a fanfare. Um, fewer launches, but, but many still. Something like 60 operators in around 30 countries have launched 5G fixed wireless. It's typically uh, offered at... at um, the fairly low end spec for the home broadband market rather than competing directly against FTTP. Um, Verizon, of course, was a bit of a flagship launch uh, early on, but I think that the attention has shifted more towards uh, T-Mobile in the US. Quite a few European operators are active. And also the, the 4G fixed wireless services are, are, are largely upgrading to, to 5G. So that's uh, a, a few, few of the big things that we're seeing in, in the consumer market. 
Okay. So thanks, uh, Stephen. I think you know most of the news has been around consumer, uh, but you know, are there is there anything notable uh, in the enterprise, uh, Tom? So I think when we're talking about business services, it's, it's it's sort of worth splitting it up into what we're seeing in the in the public networks. Um, so some of the things picking up on some of the things that Stephen said, and in the private networks. Um, which I think are much more interesting, much more exciting developments in the private yeah. networks than we're seeing in the public networks. Um, in the public networks, clearly there are 5G offers from all of the op- operators that, that Stephen mentioned that have launched um, their 5G networks. Um, so there are a smartphones for businesses, but in terms of the tariffs, there's nothing particularly exciting. It's really a continuation of what they were doing with 4G. Um, we see some operators launch fixed wireless uh, fewer than uh, Stephen was mentioning. I'm surprised it's as many as 60 for consumer for business. It's probably more like 15, 20 uh, that have launched fixed wireless for business. Um, but again, that's really a continuation of what they were doing in 4G. Um, and we also see a bit of 5G being used as backup. So in things like SD-WAN boxes, you get um, the primary connection would be broadband or something like that. And, and 5G increasingly, 5G is backup. But all of that is fairly uh, fairly standard, not that different from what was happening with, with 4G before. Um, with private networks, I think that's much more exciting, much more interesting. There are hundreds, literally hundreds of private networks now, an increasing share of those are using 5G. Now, in our tracker, we look at some of these where we can get all of the details, so who the prime contractor is, what the technology is, and, and, and so on. Um, an increasing share of those are using 5G. So we've got details on just about 200, just over 200. 71 of those are using 5G or have 5G in, in their networks. Um, and some of them are really taking advantage of the capabilities of 5G. Um, so often, or in some cases, combining that with edge. Maybe we'll talk about edge a bit more later on. So we're seeing some things happening in, the, in those private networks in the, in the business sense. Um, and I think that's interesting because that's almost a forerunner of what we can expect to see in the in the public networks three, four, five years from now. Okay, thanks, Tom. And of course, operators are investing a lot in these networks. Uh, so, um, uh, Caroline. Uh, so what do you see in, just into the state of uh, network rollout? here? Yes, I mean, so far, 5G has very much been deployed um, as an enhancement to, uh, to 4G, as both um, uh, Stephen and Tom have, have hinted at. You know, the business models in the public networks um, have been very similar to 4G and, and the networks. Um, we've been in non-standalone mode, which is still using a 4G core. So really, you wouldn't you'd just call that 4G+. plus. And for some operators, quite a lot of operators, that's going to be a perfectly good model um, for years to come. But there's a sort of growing group of leading edge operators who are really looking for some more substantial return on investment, who are looking for brand new revenue streams from 5G. Um, But those do uh, entail investing in quite radical new architectures. And we're seeing those technologies coming to market now. Um, But they do require a lot of investment, a lot of risk, um, a lot of disruption to the ecosystem that the operator is working in. Um, Some examples are um, the latest release of the free GPP standards brings in things like ultra low latency. Um, uh, Obviously, the 5G core, um, which supports network slicing, which we believe may gradually become very important to deliver highly differentiated services. There's new spectrum coming into play. Um, Tom mentioned edge compute. Um, certainly think that's going to be a major infrastructure investment to enable new services for a lot of operators. Um, AI is being used in all kinds of ways um, to complement 5G um, and improve what it can do. And we're looking at operators that have fixed networks as well as wireless, um, increasingly looking at having a converged core or converged access, um, being able to monetize those in new ways. And again, moved to, to um, very different looking experiences to what have been possible in the past. Um, so that's quite a radical technology change for, for these operators. And um, it's a big investment. Most of them are looking for co-investors um, to share a lot of this infrastructure with, with old partners or new partners, um, and really to shake up their supply chains as well. So in the process of of rethinking their networks, um, I think we're also seeing them looking at their vendors, their partners, their investors, um, and really having to think again about the whole picture before they can significantly change their business model from the kind of 4G plus we've seen so far. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. It seems like we're in the early stages, right? But, but, But 
across the board, uh, there's real progress. People are, are getting going here. Maybe we're getting a little bit of momentum going. So let's talk a little bit about what we see the next impacts being, what hasn't happened yet, but we think uh, is going to make an impact over the next couple of years here. And, and I can, let's see, just to change the order of things a little bit, go to Tom specifically a little bit more on maybe what you think is going on with Edge and, and the, the, the push beyond private LTE, pri- excuse me, private 5G. Yeah, I mean, so to start with Edge, again, we're seeing quite a lot of interest from operators around Edge. So something like we're sort of tracking the releases, press releases from the operators, maybe sort of 50 odd have said that they're interested in doing something, pilots or whatever, with Edge. Only a small number of those have actually launched anything commercially, probably uh, 10, 11, something like that. That's a mixture of um, Network Edge. So a few of the operators have launched Network Edge. So um, Verizon in the US, SK Telecom, Vodafone started it in, in, in Europe, um, so it has one location with Network Edge. So it's a, it's a start. It's not very far advanced yet, but, but it's early stages. Um, with the, the on-premise edge, the customer edge, that's probably more developed. Um, as I was saying before, it goes quite well. It, it can go quite neatly with it with the private networks. Um, and that's all, uh, because they're not constrained by what's happening with the public network. They can move a bit quicker. They can go ahead with some of the releases that that. Um, more advanced releases of 5G that um, Caroline was talking about, um, and often offer new services. Look at um, uh, guarantees and ultra low latency, and uh, all those kind of very high bandwidth services. All those kind of features that we're promised with with, with 5G, um, we're seeing some of those with those, those private net- networks. Um, and gradually, as I say, when we get more standalone networks rolled out, when we get more um, network edge location, locations rolled out. We'll, be, we'll start to see the same sort of services that we're seeing in, 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 in standalone sort of private locations like factories or ports. We'll see those offered over a, a wider area, which has implications obviously for, for enterprise services, but also for business services, that, uh, for consumer services, things like gaming and, and, and TV. Okay. Well, thanks, Tom. So, uh, so speaking of consumer services and ga- gaming and TV and, and so forth, uh, S- Stephen, what do you what do you think is actually going to start happening here? Is it, are we going to do some of those services, or is fixed wireless is fixed wireless going to move beyond what we could do with LTE and become a more significant thing? Uh, well, well yeah, yes to both. I think um, so. When when we look at the the, the continuity mobile proposition, uh, it's kind of doing more, uh, but a little bit better than the the, the big target and the big push is on the entertainment experience so a lot of operators are already active in, in some role in, in, in video streaming um, and, and as, I, as I mentioned gaming before so a, a few of the the network edge uh, trials and launches that, that Tom mentioned you know, one of the, the big early use cases for those are, are video streaming kind of CDN evolution uh, or, or, or gaming and of course, uh, one of the reasons that gaming gets a lot of attention is because the user experience for cloud gaming is, is so reliant on a good connectivity experience. Uh, mm-hmm. So this means that operators you know, actually uh, you know, can play a, a really strong role to play there. Um, they have a bit of a choice about what to do exactly. So are they just a, a distribution partner taking these services to market and potentially bundling with, uh, with, a, with a broadband service or a mobile service? Um, are they potentially act, acting more as an aggregator as gaming services move towards a more, more of a subscription model? Uh, we hear lots of things about the Netflix of gaming. Uh, you know, obviously, telcos are quite good at selling subscriptions and, uh, and, and help, helping to support that model. Uh, and, you know, and, and the kind of the mech play infrastructure as a service, uh, more with, with telcos playing a role as an enabler in, in, in that user experience. Um, so there's a lot of push there on gaming. There's lots of lots of interest in AR and VR, uh, bringing the, the, those services to customers. Um, there's lots of push and quite interesting work going on around a rich video experience, uh, multi-view video streaming, um, uh, so analytic overlays to allow you to look at stats whilst focusing on your favourite baseball star or something like that. There's, there's some some really good services around. Um, more, you mentioned fixed wireless, and certainly 5G fixed wireless makes fixed wireless more viable uh, and uh, you know, better able to address some niches. Um, we're seeing a lot of activity there. I mentioned the, the 4G fixed wireless com- companies, uh, you know, typically mobile challenges, upgrading uh, to, to 5G. Um, 
often they're targeting areas that are uneconomic with with uh, with FTTP, um, and you know, that, that really is a you know an in incremental revenue opportunity for many. It's, it, you know, it expands the the base, um, but it's not just challenge of mobile operators. Incumbents are also looking at fixed wireless as part of their technology mix. Um, and many are actually seeing that it's, it can potentially help the business case for copper switch off, for copper decommissioning. And you can see real <laughs> cost savings there, of course. So Telenor in Norway is a good example there. Um, for, for many mobile operators, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's another uh, technology option. It helps their commercial discussions with wholesale players that they're potentially reliant on. It, it gives their customers different options and, and, and you know, potentially more segmentation uh, for, 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 the, for the operator. All right. Thanks. So, Caroline, turning to the network side of things, it does seem, you know, quite, you noted quite a few things that are in the works here, but it does seem like uh, we've just got a lot of people announcing things and trialing things and so forth, and there's a lot of potential. But it, it, it seems to me there's a, a fairly long runway for all this new technology to come into being. What sort of what's the next step that we see, we're going to see real progress on the network side? Yes, I mean, I do think there's a long runway. And part of the reason for that is because there are potentially so many different technologies that you could deploy in parallel with one another, but each of which is quite a major change in its own right, as I, as I touched on earlier. Um, so I think for um, a lot of operators who are really trying to do something radical, it's still in, in those early stages with, with just a, a few exceptions. Um, one of the, the big changes, which has very much been over the horizon for quite a lot of years, um, is actually um, running the network in the cloud, um, so virtualizing it. In, and that's happened to some extent with the core and is very much um, the key to the 5G core, which is largely being deployed in a cloud native way now. And operators are just starting to do that. And, and that will... Mm -hmm. Um, capabilities like slicing to be done in the most flexible way because the big challenge is virtualizing the RAN. Um, if you can do that, that will introduce a great deal of flexibility and programmability into that mobile network. Um, but it's extremely challenging. And uh, to Tom's point about edge, I mean, we think one of the uh, one of the things that may drive Telco Edge is um, this 5G VRAM. Um, mm -hmm. This 5G has needs very, very um, low latencies. You you can't have um, big centralized clouds running uh, running your RAM. Um, those those clouds have got to be distributed um, to quite an extreme um, amount, but perhaps even right out to the cell sites, um, which will mean telcos who choose to invest in that infrastructure really. Uh, either building or, or partnering for a fairly large number of, of edge sites. But it's not so much the number, it's they will have to be very, very high capability in order to support the huge processing power that goes with a 5G RAN. So we're starting to see operators experimenting with the idea of monetizing those edge sites um, to support very high value services for um, enterprise and potentially consumer um, customers rather than just using them to support their own network. Mm -hmm. And it is over the horizon, but it's coming a little bit closer. I mean, we're seeing some quite credible uh, distributed VRAN um, deployment plans, which are maybe four to five years from now to get to scale. But that's actually not a very long time when you think about um, you know, uh, the architectures that, that are involved here and the huge amount of change. So um, I think that's where we're going to see a real um, transformational point. Um, but as to go back to my earlier point, it's only a few operators that are going to do this in the early mid 2020s. They'll kind of show it can be done if, if things go well. It won't, certainly won't be a mainstream option until probably 2030 and beyond for most. Yeah. And if I can just come in on that, just from an enterprise perspective. So you can see why the telecom operators, they need all of that processing power. It, potentially in the cell sites, whether enterprises do, I think is another question. Yes. Um, and we already see, so, so Lumen has built out its edge network across the US and it's saying with 75 sites, it can reach, I think it's 98% of businesses in the US with far, a sub five millisecond latency. So if they only need, um, I mean, that's the US, obviously a massive yep. geographic area, they only need 75 sites. Um, right. The operators are building out tens of thousands of sites now, whether enterprises need it that close to them, I think is an open question. Probably not. Right? So, 
It, yeah. it, it's how much you can justify the business case of, of, of doing what you're talking about. It has to be justified on the network itself, not necessarily selling all of those services to to enterprises. I think that's a good point. There may be some wishful thinking in the, um, you know, if we've built this huge edge cloud, can we monetize it? I think perhaps it's not just the latency. I think there's also um, this idea of there being a lot of processing power being distributed. So yeah. for enterprises that maybe are going to be using advanced AI, mm. and we're seeing some processes developing that sort of, they do 5G, and then when 5G is not transmitting, they do AI, those sort yeah. of architectures. But again, it's it's experimental at this point. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. interesting with Rakuten, obviously, it's building out how many thousands of, of, yes. of, of cell sites, but actually of those that it's going to commercialise for enterprise age, I think it's 58 so it's only a very, very yeah, small subset. A subset. Yeah. 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 So I'll follow up on this issue that Caroline, you were saying, you know, four to five year time frame before you get that critical mass in, in some of this uh, new technology being deployed. And so I thought we'd sort of talk about, you know, I, you know, I've looked at your CapEx forecast, Caroline, and you say, well, more money's been going, still going into LTE than in 5G, and it will for a few more years. So we're, in, in many ways, we're, we're using 5G to extend and do things we would have liked to have done with 4G and so forth. When when do we get to the point where something really different happens because uh, of 5G? And uh, uh, I think a question for 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 all of us, but but uh, but I'll just go back to you, Caroline. And say, you know, when do you think enough operators or, or some operators will really have enough there that's really different uh, than what you can get with with 4G that we're seeing really different things happening? Yes, I mean, it's a good question. And, and of course, it will vary a lot from market to market. And I don't think it's all about whether it's developed economies or not, as it, as it was perhaps in earlier generations. It, it often depends whether there's a leading operator that is prepared to really take a risk and do something different. And often that, that operator may be a challenger, such as Reliance Geo in, in India, being a good example. Um, also picking up on Tom's point that a lot of the real innovation is going on in private networks or in smaller networks, um, we're particularly in countries that have um, allocated spectrum on perhaps a more localised basis, like um, Germany, uh, Netherlands, UK, that allows different um, service providers to build out some networks without having to do a national rollout. And those may be <coughs> telcos or they may be somebody else. But So I think we're seeing a lot of quite advanced services being uh, developed for quite localised or specific use, maybe for an industry, a campus, um, or a particular community, um, a city with very advanced um, demand. But I think at the point where you could say that most can, most users in on a nationwide basis um, across a whole country are going to feel this sort of transformational effect from the 5G network, um, I, I don't think we're going to see that for quite a few years yet. Um, and I think it'll, for most people, it will be more gradual and that there'll suddenly be something that's massively different. Um, a lot of 5G is transformational more for the operator and what the operator can do than I think what the enterprise or the consumer actually mm. perceives. I think they'll just see a gradual improvement. And then in 10 years, maybe they look back and, and wonder how they ever coped with 4G, but they might not have noticed the kind of process in, in, as they went along. Yeah. Okay. So I think, yes, we, we, there's the a lot of technology here that affects, that makes it an operator different from an operator. Uh, Stephen, when, when will consumers actually see something? Oh, I couldn't have possibly done that with 4G, but now I can with 5G. Uh, yeah, well, uh, listening to Caroline then, I was reminded of, of the William Gibson quote, the future's already here, but it's just not distributed yet. And it sounds yeah. like the future is coming, but it's coming to a, a port or a factory <laughs> site. And it's going to take a while before it gets to, to the consumers. Mm. And, yeah. um, uh, and I think the, I mean, uh, the, the, the use cases I mentioned earlier, the entertainment propositions, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, they're, they're extensions of the, the current experiences, largely. Yep. And some of the, uh, the, 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 the very future-oriented stuff that we see around the consumer proposition is reliant on devices in particular, um, mm -hmm. moving a smartphone into, into a world of, of smart glasses and, uh, and sensors and, and so on. Uh, and obviously, a, a lot of things have to happen in order to make that happen. Um, yep. And the, the the it's unlikely to be the telcos that are, that are leading mm -hmm. this push. 
And there is a bit of a, 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 a build it and they will come kind of argument present in the market from, from, from the telcos. Uh, and they're generally you know, kind of pushing this out you know, five or 10 years. This is, a, this is 2030 kind of, kind of visions. Mm. Uh, but there are yeah, big questions about how do we get there? Um, and, you know, what, what roles exactly the, the telecoms operators will provide? I mean, there's been lots of talk this, this year in particular about the, the metaverse. Uh, yeah. Moved on from the tactile internet into the metaverse. Um, and, you know, the, the telcos... There is definitely a connectivity play to, to, to support that, but it's going to be pushed ahead by Facebook and by Microsoft and you know and, and a whole range of gaming players and platforms. And so, yeah, the, the question for the telcos is, uh, yeah, what role do they have there? Who do they support? Yeah. Who, do they, who do they partner with? Um, some some telecoms operators are leading that charge. Uh, they have a bit more confidence and they have stronger brands. Uh, to Caroline's point about different operators having different appetites here and, and in particular in you know, Asian markets where there isn't necessarily a strong global internet play the, the telecom mm. operator has a stronger position in the consumer market and uh, as an innovator uh, they're often less afraid and, and, uh, and see a clearer way forward to, to pushing this you know, and the extreme example is SK Telecom which has its own mm. sure. uh, if land I think it's called yeah so let me just follow up with you. Uh, we've alluded to virtual reality and all. Is Do you think virtual reality is going to become a, a big kind of mainstream thing and really drive stuff in, in, in 5G? Or is it is it inevitably just such a niche thing that it doesn't, on a, on, a, on a scale basis, it doesn't make that much difference for 5G? Well, I mean, so, so virtual reality... I think it's more going to be augmented reality or, or mixed reality for, for 5G because those are the ones that are more mobile. Um, mm-hmm. I, I do think that you know, there's, there's definitely something to... I think gaming will change and 5G can play a role in that. So yep. you, you often think about the gaming experience as being associated with, with big hardware consoles. Um, mm-hmm. but, but that's that's been necessary in the past and it's not right. necessarily going to be necessary in the future. <laughs> And so I think the, the sure. gaming, the gaming developer world will will support new experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, how active the telcos are going to be in, in, in that is is an open question. Uh, but I, yeah, I think I think a lot a lot a lot will be changing. And for the, for a generation of, of kids brought up on Roblox and Fortnite and um, and Minecraft, I, I think there is going to be a a, a, a a very different kind of experience and. and Set of social interaction, entertainment experiences, and and commerce opportunities in in the future. Okay. So enterprise, you know, Tom, the, the, this whole five G thing, a, a lot of it hinges when you hear various uh, briefings that we get and that kind of thing. It seems to hinge on oh, all these things you can do in enterprise. Um, at what point do you do you see that oh enterprises are actually doing something different now really fundamentally different the way they run their businesses because of 5g yeah i'm i'm not sure it's really going to ever be because of 5g um, okay but, but but some of the things that we're seeing are happening with the with the operators in the enterprise sector are, are already happening and so mm-hmm. like, the thing like Stephen was saying from a consumer perspective it probably isn't going to be the operators driving it um, in the enterprise space, I think operators are quite often better placed anyhow. Now, that's not to say that they're going to drive the development of this technology, because they're not, because it's going to be the Nokia's, the Ericsson's, or um, the Microsoft's, or AWS's. All of those people are going to be the, the, the technology vendors. Um, but they need somebody to put it together, to put these different components together to work yep. with the enterprises. And quite often, that's not going to be them directly. They're going to work with, with somebody else. Um, and quite often, that already is the telecoms operator. And if you look mm-hmm. at... Um, and, and this sort of transition is already happening. If you look at Orange's revenues over the past two or three years, they've gone for their business division. Um, IT revenue has gone from being about 25% of their revenue to being about 40% of their revenue. So yeah. if you think of Orange Business Services, it's almost not an operator anymore. It's almost not just about connectivity. It's about that other stuff. Um, mm-hmm. it's, got a, it's made some big acquisitions in things like cloud and security. It's got a really big cloud team. It's got something like more than 2,000 people, cloud specialists. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. So that's orange, but that's not unique. If you look at like BT, has got massive security. Verizon's also got huge, um, huge teams for these sort of services. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're already playing this sort of role for, for, for some of the enterprises 
Um, there's obviously the enterprise opportunity. It's, it's, it's lots of discrete opportunities, but there's a consumer one. is kind of there are smaller numbers of bigger companies. For, for the enterprises, yes, there's the, it's kind of a, a bit of a cliche about the 5G use case private networks about ports, but there are ports and operators are servicing, you know, putting those private networks in for ports and putting in um, edge computing and helping them with their multi-cloud um, uh, networks and with security. So operators already kind of have this role, um, <clears throat> but that's almost independent of 5G. 5G gives them more capabilities yep. and enables them to do so, some of the things that we talk about on, on 5G, so like guaranteed um uh, service levels or ultra low latency or very high speeds. These are things that operators have been doing in the fixed world for a few, well, for a long time. Yeah. Some of those capabilities. It just means that they can offer those services in a uh, wirelessly. So it's not. It doesn't just hinge around um, 5G. Okay. 5G is just an extension of what they can do. And it sounds like it also doesn't hinge just around connectivity, but the ability to let's say put together yeah. a solution and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we just. I think it's where it's interesting. Um, when you think of the different operators coming at this from different perspectives, so I mentioned Orange and Verizon, clearly big incumbent players with massive um, IT divisions, um, but maybe not the fastest moving in, in some of these areas. And you compare that to like a Rakuten and a Dish, who are clearly very dynamic, very fast moving, doing things that the other guys wouldn't think of doing. Um, so potentially very disruptive, but they don't have the base of business customers. They don't have that kind of expertise. Mm-hmm. They don't have 2000 yeah. Um, cloud specialists working with businesses. Mm-hmm. So you've got this potential uh, very interesting conflict between you know, who's going to come out on top. Is it going to be this more disruptive play from these guys who don't have a background in business or is it going to be the uh, well, in Japan, the NTTs or the, or the Verizons or the Oranges? And there's a, a B2B2C angle here, yeah. of, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, helping so the consumer market as, as in consumers as end users, but helping a whole bunch of businesses to to bring new new experiences and new services to those customers. And often it's going to be the operators. I mean, there's a similar tension. Mm. It could be operators that have existing B2B plays and good vertical mm-hmm. uh, market understanding that can help uh, sell something different and, and, and make new experiences happen. Or yeah. it could be somebody coming from a different place in the value chain like Rakuten who, yeah. who can bring a whole bunch of commerce capabilities yeah. and uh, uh, know-how from different areas to, to help mm-hmm. with that. I guess so, the so, challenges on that is that so often those enterprise experts that you're talking about, Tom, and the wireless connectivity people and the consumer people in telco just don't really talk to each other. Yeah. And we're always talking about how telcos need to have all these new partners in order to go after different opportunities, but often they can't. They find it hard to partner with their own different divisions, yeah. and that seems to be that they're perhaps sometimes we we get very focused on technology yeah. and forget about the organizational aspects of some of yeah. this. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a real challenge for operators because they, they want to grow in, like the enterprise area, they want to grow in cloud. So they build the cloud division and they have it as a separate structure, yeah. separate CEO that maybe doesn't even report into the enterprise division, but then it needs to work with some of the things that are coming from the connectivity team. And you, you, can, you can see that with some of, the, some of the big European operators in particular. Yeah. So it does seem, uh, and I'm going to turn to you, Caroline, for a response on this is we're going to need to wrap up our uh, panel time here. And But it's a great conversation. I think all the four of us could probably talk about this for a long, long time, couldn't we? But uh, uh, it does seem like with 5G, there's a lot of different business models out there. And, and you know, this conversation, does, uh, we, we see that not everybody's going to do the same thing. Uh, and I wonder, uh, Caroline, one of the things we we see more of the possibility of people offering um, wholesale, uh, you know, connectivity as a wholesale service because they don't want to build out all this other stuff that Tom was talking about uh, and, and so forth. And so it, how real do you see that being? I think it's very real. Um, I think there are different ways of doing this. I think we're already seeing operators um, who have, of course, always had some wholesale business. I mean, a lot of operators support MVNAs, for instance, on their mobile networks. Um, but really looking at the capacity that they can build out with 5G, um, particularly as they start moving to the new spectrum bands and even into millimeter wave, is really enabling them to offer quite um, a significant wholesale offering and not just to MVNOs, but perhaps to enterprises, private network operators all. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a way to get into these, these different um, sort of environments that we're talking about here. But I think then... The other interesting aspect of wholesale is what DISH is trying to do, which is build a sliceable network that will be wholesale only in its case, and it will even treat its own internal MVNOs as wholesale customers. Um, And it's obviously going after the enterprise as well. 
with all the caveats Tom mentioned, mm. that they don't have enterprise experience. But perhaps if they can support enough uh, experienced enterprise service providers on their various slices, then that could be a way for them to address that market without having to invest in um, in moving up to you know in all the service platforms and, and all the skills and so on. So okay. I think that's an interesting model. So yes, I, I think wholesale is going to be increasingly important to a lot of operators and. Mm-hmm. They'll do it in different ways, depending on how digital their platform is and, and how their market runs and how it's regulated, of course. Okay. Kind of so, back. yeah, Stephen. Sorry. What, what, what do you think, Steve? Right. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. I'll, I'll... I think it sort of links back to where we started the conversation, talking about what operators are doing with 5G and it's, a lot of it's con- continuity of, of 4G and the business models are the same. 4G had basically the same model as 3G, had the same model as 2G, and 5G right now mostly has the same, the same model. But there are lots of things that they can experiment with but it also that they need to have the systems in place, but also the organization needs to be willing to, mm-hmm. to play around. Mm-hmm. With the yeah. Yes. Yes. And take some risks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah. I think we're going to need to wrap up our time here. I'm going to give uh, give Stephen the last word then on uh, <laughs> thoughts about, uh, you know, different business models or how that's going to, uh, you know, impact the, uh, the consumer side of the business. Uh, okay. Well, well, I was just, I think we've we've all been talking about it a little bit that you know, every operator is different, right? and you know we've mm-hmm. talked to a lot of operators and 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 try to understand their specific needs, and there will be some appetite from some operators to to be digital lifestyle providers and to to make uh, the, the the big vision of, of the future happen and to take their customers with them. Uh, for for others, it's much less clear, uh, and you know, yeah. this, this, uh, maybe dabbling a little bit in kind of rich media and, and, and gaming, uh, but that's essentially a kind of a continuity play. Uh, what we haven't really talked about is the is the, the cost side of, of the question. So for for many operators, you know, they, they won't see clear revenue opportunities here from that you know, from mm. the, from the mass market. They might not have much of a position in in enterprise to to, to, to build on. So for them, we're looking at a, a, a difficult business case of, of, of flat revenue, flat yep. costs, essentially, um, and, and maybe trying to operate your business in a, in a different way to, to, to adjust to that reality. All right. Well... I think that there's there's a lot going on. I think we had a great conversation. Obviously, we'll have a lot more to continue talking about this. There's a lot more to uh, to develop and so forth. So uh, thank you all for your time and the conversation we've had here. Thanks to uh, people who've been listening so far. Uh, and as I said, you can a- ask questions for us, and we'll uh, respond to them later. And I'm going to turn it now back to David. Thanks, Larry. So firstly, just let me say thank you to, to you, Larry, to Tom, Caroline and Stephen for that excellent and informative session. And I'll second what Larry said and thank you to everyone who has attended. I would just remind you of a couple of things before you go. So there are a couple of resources that you can access. Uh, so please uh, feel free to do so. Uh, as Larry also mentioned, you can still submit questions. These sessions are available on demand. So our uh, presenters will get back to you in the coming days by email. And do feel free to connect for our panelists via the console widgets as well on social media, email, uh, LinkedIn, for example. Uh, we're always very happy to, to do that as well. Uh, lastly, I would just say after this session, do feel free to make your way back to the event homepage where you can select uh, another session. So I hope you enjoyed this session and we look forward to welcoming you to another. Thanks for attending. Take care.